Hey, welcome to Hear God's Word. This is Michael Weinger. In this podcast, we study and dissect the Bible to better understand what it means and is trying to say. We'll cover theology and dig into the original meaning through language and word studies. We'll even discuss scientific and historical ties, but we'll always come back to the basics. There's so many layers to the Bible, and it's all important. So, if you want to hear what God has to say, then let's dive in. Hey everyone, today we're continuing to trudge through the story of the very first world war, at least that's recorded in scripture and in the Near East. And we had talked about how basically there's the four allies of like the great powers of the day, at least in the East. We have, you know, Shinar and Samaria and Elam and uh, whatever the nations or the Goyim or maybe like Assyria or something like that or uh, even uh, potentially the Amorites. Um, All of these groups kind of are mixed in and have a really tangled history uh, because I know we've talked about the Chaldeans before, and technically they were in Samaria at one point. They also are affiliated with Babylon, but they were also in Assyria, and then they also later were on in Persia. So these groups and tribes sometimes settle in different places and cities, and that's why ethnicities are more important in ethnicity being a people group and people groups went through different territories and cities and sometimes were under different leadership or spread out and so we'll especially get into that today and we'll be continuing what happens with the farther east world powers and the dead sea valley alliance but first i wanted to take a minute to do something that we haven't before and i want to start off in prayer about the things that we're going to talk about today so god Thank you so much for passing down words of history and wisdom and knowledge to us. And thank you that you communicated and helped Moses and the scribes and those who wrote these parts of history down that they were able to accurately pinpoint important things of the past and help us to see and realize how they're important to the story of the world and especially the story that is built up through the bible and how i know a lot of these themes can be important because it comes into play later on and who knows if someday some of these themes even just in these three verses with it talking about these few nations going to war it having some kind of relevance into today and in the future and i pray also that you would open up everyone's ears who listen to this episode because This is your word, and I pray that it would be broken down and understood in a way that the scholar can understand, that the skeptic can understand, and that the person who is just uh, trying to figure out a few things about what the Bible is trying to communicate, that they would get more wisdom from your word and just these few verses than they thought was possible that you can get out 
God, because I'm looking down at the notes that you helped me to accumulate, and uh, there's a lot of things, God, just packed into a few verses. And so help me to accurately communicate and not only give people ears to be able to hear this, but also that means minds to understand and comprehend and take in and see the relevance of how the passage ends up having implications. And I've been so thankful to be on this journey and doing this podcast. And thank you for everyone who takes the time to listen. And even if this is the first time that someone is listening, that they're here today. And I pray that you bless them, especially for their efforts to get to know you more because you're God Almighty. And I pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. So we're going to begin reading chapter 14, verse 5. And it says, In the fourteenth year, Kadalamar and the kings who were his allies came and defeated the Raphaites in Ashtaroth, Karnaim, the Zuzites in Ham, and the Emites in Shiva Kariathim, and the Horites in the hill country of Seir, as far as El Paran, which is in the desert. Then they attacked En Mishpat, that is Kadesh, again, and they conquered all the territory of the Amalekites as well as the Amorites who were living in Hezazan Tamar. So we're going to start breaking down what was going on with this battle because we've already went over the tension. We left off on how there were these, you know, uh, Dead Sea Valley alliance city-states and tribes who were rebelling and either, you know, a not paying their taxes anymore, maybe even fighting back and killing off troops that were occupying their area at the time. You know, who knows in what kind of way they were rebelling, but we actually if you take a look at a map and look at the descriptions, you see that it sidesteps. We're no longer talking about the Death Valley Alliance anymore. We take a three-verse pause and we see how Alam isn't just subjugating the people of the Death Valley. They are taking over and conquering and defeating it says specifically that they attacked and defeated the people of you would say the southern canaanite and amorite tribes of that time and we'll talk more about the amorites if you're wondering wait we haven't really talked much about them before we will in a few minutes However, you can see down at the very end of verse 7 that it does talk about them. But we not only have Kador Lamar who's doing attacking, but it's his alliance. It says the kings that he was allied with were also attacking. And one thing that I actually just learned in reviewing for today is that, believe it or not, Hammurabi was actually an Amorite, but he was also a Babylonian. So, you know, how exactly does that work? And that's where 
I was talking earlier where just because I live in America doesn't mean I'm just American. I'm also Italian. I'm German. That's where my last name comes from. I'm French. I'm English. And, you know, if you take my Italian roots back more, I'm probably Roman. If you take my English roots back further, I probably have some sort of Nordic influence that originally came over, and especially because the relatives I have from France also come from Normandy, and Norman means the people or the men of the North. So the people of the North are obviously the Nordics, and that is that area. And so I don't just have one identity, and I think that's a good way to understand what's going on here. Wait, wait, it, uh, you know, uh, uh, Amara fell, you know, if he is Amarabi and he's possibly both Amorite and Babylonian, because Babylon was his kingdom, just as America is my kingdom, but there's records showing that he was by maybe ethnicity, Amorite, and so even though King Amaraphel possibly could have been Amorite and Babylonian, and just as if Italy started attacking America, or let's just say Germany started another world war, which we're not going to take this too far. But theoretically, if that were to happen, I'm not going to fight for my ancestors' ethnicity. I'm going to fight against the Germans and the Italians if I have to to defend where I live. And so just because someone has an ethnicity doesn't mean they necessarily are fully dedicated to that group. And many times there's people of the same ethnicity fighting each other anyways. It's a sad world we live in. But with that said, the fact that Kador Lamar, who's the Elamite and Aramaphel, and as well as Ariuk and Tidal. So we have all these guys who are attacking, but it seems clear that Kador Lamar, the Elamite, is the top dog of the kings, and he's the one who's heading up a lot of the attacks. So it says in verse 5, as we get into it, that after the 13 years with those Dead Sea Valley regions, after there was rebellion, he actually started to attack some of the mainly southern areas below the Dead Sea, and there is a lot of territory and desert over there, but also some regions even spanning to the middle of the Dead Sea region and outward a little bit and then up the shoehorn, but we'll talk about these people and places a little more. So we get to the very first people that are attacked by the Alliance, and that is the Raphaites. And this is a very interesting group. And we've talked about it a bunch before, but it's so easy to not care about any of the names that are hard for us to pronounce. We just read them and we never remember anything about them. But 
my challenge is every time you come across one that you don't know, try and figure out who they are. Just as if you met someone here in real life, you would, if you got their name, try to log it in your memory. You'd even try to get to know them a little more, ask some questions, and you can ask questions and do research on these people and places, and you can find out a lot of things that actually can spark a lot of future interest and can keep you invested in the story of the Bible. Whereas if you just treat it as if it's literally just sounds on a piece of paper, it's not going to mean anything to you. But now let's get into the hardcore part. So the Raphaites were most likely as we've talked about, an ethnicity, a people group, and they didn't necessarily have one place that they lived because we'll see their intermingling within several peoples and places as we keep talking. But we need a little bit of context. So it says that the Raphaites, at least here, were in the land of Ashtaroth, Karnaim. And so with that, there is, while we talk about the place first, several mentions of Ashtaroth and other spots of scripture. You know, you can look up Joshua 13, 12, which says, that is the whole kingdom of Og and Bashan, who had reigned in Ashtaroth and Adre. He was the last of the Raphaites. Moses had defeated them and taken over their land. So, in this little passage in Joshua 13, 12, that was, we have this king in Bashan. And so, it says he reigned in Ashtaroth. So, Ashtaroth is a city, but the city Ashtaroth, as well as this place that was also in the region, Edre, they were both in the nation of Bashan. And this guy Og, who is the king, many, many centuries later, we have him reigning over Bashan, but in Bashan, he's specifically reigning in the cities of Ashtaroth and Adre, and it says that he was the last of the Rephites. So, this is the last guy of his ethnicity. But we also learn some other interesting things, like now we need to get into who the Raphaites are in a minute, in a little more detail. But now we got the picture, there's this land at least that is later on called Bashan, which Ashtaroth is a city within that country or region or nation in future times but for the moment the king of the Raphaites who was in Ashtaroth it was probably a city state meaning that they were self-sufficient and they were their own hub and people and group and they had their own, you know, state in and of themselves. They were kind of governed as their own independent country, city. Uh, but it's possible they could have been part of either, let's say, uh, the larger Amorites, or it's, uh, you know, possible they could have already also been under the rule of Elam at this point. 
but then maybe they could have also been in the list of groups that rebelled against Alam. So now Alam's like, uh uh, you ain't getting away with that. You know, we're coming after you. Or it's possible that Alam was just taking over more territory and they hadn't taken over this group yet because it does say later down that they took over essentially the entire Amalekites. And so that one is quite intense. Uh, we'll get more into them as well later. But we also can jump back and ask, you know, oh, Ashtaroth, it, that's not the full name of the place. It was actually called Ashtaroth Karnaim. And there's actually also a verse that talks about Karnaim. And just as I've talked about before, remember when I had mentioned Padan Aram before, the interesting thing is Aram is its own place. So sometimes you have these morphing of names or one of the words is describing the place. And in Amos 6.13, it actually makes mention of Karnaim. And it just essentially says, Rejoice in the conquest of Lodabar and say, Did we not take Karnaim by our own strength? So here this place is, and it specifically means horn. And so it symbolizes strength. So they were doing a play on words there, which is kind of funny. And Hebrew likes doing that kind of stuff in their language. But we get back to and can't leave it unspoken anymore. Who are the Raphaites? So through all of the referencing and scripture, that you can go through a lot of connections point to them being Amorites and we had talked about them earlier. The Amorites will kind of start an intro now. We're actually a pretty large shoehorn of a people group scattered and they started in the range all the way from mid or lower Babylon and then they hooked up and around through the Aram area down into the Dead Sea Valley all the way down to the Gulf of Aqaba and so it was a very large huge territory that they occupied during history. So a lot of these groups could be mashed into the people of the Amorites. And like I was saying, even the king of Shinar possibly could have even had some Amorite blood or maybe even was a leader of them. And so the thing as we go deeper we also see that these groups are being subjugated like we were talking about with the dead sea valley allies they were sons of canaan and so are all of the groups that we're going to mention all of these groups that are from the Dead Sea Valley all the way down to the Gulf of Aqaba, which is down by those gulfs uh, in between Arabia, the Sinai Peninsula. You have all of these groups. And so the ones that we'll be talking about will be 
anywhere in that shoehorn of from the upper right and then as you swing in a shoehorn down and around all the way up around the Dead Sea Valley and we'll even see the mention of a group or at least I'll make a reference to it through some other scripture that ends up pointing to a place that we've already talked about. So I hope you're not getting lost in the details because we're about to hit one of the most controversial parts of what we'll be talking about, and that is all of these references to the Raphaites being giants. And if you look at what the name Raphaite means, it essentially means other. And so the Raphaites are basically described as these other kind of people or these distinct people. And as it was mentioning, Og that we were reading about in Joshua, he was the last of his people or kind. And that's because a lot of people, if you remember, when we talked about the Nephilim, we had mentioned that they were on the earth back in those days and after the flood. So, even though we never see the term Nephilim again, the question is, where do they appear again? And most people suggest, especially because there's mentions of the Raphaites being tall people, which is why they could be referred to as other. Is it possible that these were just a tall genetic group that was ethnically profiled and that a lot of groups were just scared and intimidated of them, so they took them out? Or was there actually some messed up stuff in their DNA and were they not fully human or were they part of whatever was going on before the flood and that strand survived? Or is it possible that sons of God either from heaven came back and re populated and tampered with the human population through breeding with humans. Um, these things are possible, and this group ends up being the Raphaites. There's a possibility. Uh, and then, as we've also talked about, people who have the theory of essentially the sons of Cain being the humans who are dirtying the bloodline because they're just evil people. It seems like everyone who comes through this line, there's nothing good about them and they always turn out evil. Did God allow something like this to be the case? And is God allowing a cosmically strange story where he sculpts and puts certain people on this earth to not be, you know, either truly human or uh, to not fully be people made in his image. Oh man, this is. A scary road to go down because once we start talking about things like this, then it does leave the possibility for things such as what the Nazis or other people 
from extreme branches of socialism and evolution when you carry it down the line essentially the thought is well we need the strongest people to survive and we're more fully or normal human and them you know they're not when you start to go down that road the world becomes a terrifying place and you have exactly another holocaust on your hands you have ethnic cleansing and we know that these things can be pretty despicable and disgusting and horrible for our world entire people groups have almost gone because of and who knows there probably are and there are there have been many people groups that have come and gone during history and they have been wiped out by rulers and it's not always because of just ethnic profiling sometimes it's just because of prideful rulers who want power land for themselves and there's just a group that happens to stand in the way I don't know if these groups were just standing in the way of Alam wanting to expand or whether they were viewed as a dangerous group or whether there was something like genetically different and like not humanly normal about them if they were not, you know, truly made by God, but some kind of experimental species that had come up i've heard all sorts of experiments we don't know what in the world was going on in ancient history and there will be people who claim out there that they know exactly what's going on you know they were experiments of uh the aliens who came from the planet nibiru who were actually the ancient uh you know alien god race of the anunnaki and an interesting thing is i wanted to bring in the conversation about them because later on we'll actually hit on the group of them we have this group called the anakim that also come up in a later book of Deuteronomy. If you go to chapter 2, verse 12, it talks about this group of the Anakim being like the Raphaites. And so a lot of people say, ah, oh, the Anakim, the Anunnaki, you know, same thing. There's definitely something weird going on, and we see later on that even as we get further than Og and Joshua, we have another giant who is surviving through the Philistines, and it says that the Anakim were actually in Philistine and da 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 Hebron. So, where was Abram living at the time? He was in Hebron. So, who knows if Abram was actually mingling with some giants? It's possible that some of these Anakim were actually in that city at the time. And from everything that we know, these were not good people. Uh, and who knows if they even were in Sodom and maybe contributed to some of the evil there. I don't know. But kind of reining it in and tying up some of the conspiratorial portion of what we're going to be talking about, we'll go into more detail because all these groups actually, in these first three at least, are part of the Raphaites because 
we see in later parts of Scripture, which we'll go into, that they are mixed into. But before jumping into the other ones, I wanted to just hit on a couple things summarizing this again. So we have the superpowers in the East. We have all of these Dead Sea Valley places. And I wanted to mention Ashtaroth, Karnaim. This was probably in the upper Jordan area, so above the Dead Sea by a little bit. And that's most likely where these Raphaites were living. And it's a general name for a type of people or people group. And like I said, were they an ethnicity or maybe were they even a different kind of human? Were they possibly some of the skulls that we find of these really weird looking headed human, but like kind of not human species, especially some of the giant bones? Like, were they really humans or was there this other race that wasn't even considered human? And was it some kind of evil spiritual propaganda and uh, experiments that were going on at the beginning of history, creating some abomination like I've talked about in the Nephilim episode. Some people suggest that that's how we got the myths of hybrid creatures like mermaids being like part fish, part human, and having fairies being <laughs> like part human, part whoever knows what else, or stuff that's kind of, you know, a little more normal, fawns, you know, having part human, part go like, you know, I don't think uh, these Raphaites were exactly that, and we've never found evidence in the fossil collection of the world that proves any of those things. But, you know, people speculate, how else did we get the myths? And of course, there wouldn't be any, you know, evidence left around, uh, especially if everything about these kinds of people were trying to be destroyed. And especially because we'll see on later that God also wants them to take the remaining people out from these groups, just as God had to take out the Nephilim. There is just something weird that is going on with this group of people, and that's where, for the moment, we'll leave it. But the Near East powers are attacking the Rephaites. They're, you know, up in the northern Jordan area, not the country of Jordan, but the Dead Sea Valley region. And next in the list, in verse 5, we have them attacking the Zuzim, which we'll mention another verse in a minute that goes over how they're connected to the Raphaites. But it says that they're in Ham. So if you remember, Ham was one of Noah's three sons. So where was the city or the city state or the country or the location or region of Ham? So that's where we can jump into Deuteronomy 2.20. And we'll read verse 19 also, which gives a little bit more idea. But it says, when you come to the Ammonites, do not harass or provoke them to war. And then in verse 20, it goes on to say, that too was considered a land of the Rephaites who used to live there. But the Ammonites called them Zamzumites. 
So even though it's a longer version of Zuzim, a lot of times, as you can see, the names change or we abbreviate all the time and sometimes they leave off parts of words or have different endings. And especially as there were so many different countries that had different names for the same place, it's no wonder something like this could have happened. But also an interesting thing is that the Zamzumim essentially translates to the mighty one or mighty nation. And another interesting connection with that, back to what we were talking about, the Zuzims or the Zamzumims, they were, you know, seemingly by their name, probably mighty people. And who were also mighty people of renown from back in the day? Oh, also the Nephilim and also one of Ham's descendants. We have Nimrod, who was a mighty warrior before the Lord or against, however you want to interpret that. But all of these interesting ties, like scripture is not always meant to be easy and straightforward. It's meant to be studied. And so I think that sometimes having a nice cup of coffee and morning inspirational quote of the day doesn't really do you justice if you're trying to really learn what the Bible has to say. And that's why I'm trying to do this podcast, because you should definitely have some, I like tea instead of coffee, have some tea in the morning or coffee if that's your choice, or water if you don't do either, whatever you drink in the morning, and spend some time with God. For me, I work night shift, so <laughs> I go into work, and thankfully I have some time that I'm able to study scripture during my work. So I go in, I open up Bible Hub, I open up my notes, and I start going deep into what the scripture is trying to say. Because otherwise, you know, I come out being like, wow, I just read 70 names and I don't know any of them. Well, I guess I'm on to the next story. You know, that's not how scripture is meant to be. They purposely put names in the scripture for you to actually learn them. Kind of like if you were to hear a name, as I was saying earlier, in person and you would ask that person more about themselves, you would get to know them. And so, with that said, We'll continue on with the Zuzims and Ham and all of these connections. So the Zuzims are part of the Raphims, and I just realized that I called them the Raphims. But the interesting thing, again, about the biblical languages is you know, in our English ones, a lot of times it says Raphaites, but if I call them the Raphaim, if you guys can remember that in Hebrew, when you add im, it's just an apostrophe s. So basically, the group is the Raphas, if you wanted to, you know, uh, call them by a really colloquial version uh, that no one calls them by. You could technically say that, or you can say the Raphaites, or you can call them the Raphaim. So anytime you hear these names, I apologize that in my mind, my mind connects the thoughts and just merges everything together. And if you've noticed, I go back and forth between calling Babylon, Babylon, uh, Samaria, Acadia. Amorite, like there's 
Shinar. There's so many Tynes connections. Even like we were talking about, you have that mix of the Chaldeans that are also down there. So there's just so many different ways to call all of the same groups. And they had different names in different places at different times, but they're all the same and in some ways they're also always morphing so it's hard to put your finger on one specific moment and say this is the only exact name that you can call them by studying uh, ancient scripture can be very challenging but i hope you're starting to connect all of the names together kind of like i have been for the sake of just making connections in scripture. And I hope that you're starting to bridge some of those gaps that are kind of difficult to cross because of not understanding how and why there's so many different names that are difficult to get and why if you read it in 10 different versions, you'll get four different names for the same exact group and in some versions they won't even give you a name they'll just translate the term into what it means so <laughs> it's very interesting the way the the bible is written but there's things that we can learn like we're learning about this war that was going on and don't forget, this is Abram's story, but we're just taking a moment to pause to say, hey, while Abram was alive, there was this big war that was going on. And you have to remember that this is Abram's story, but at the same time, we're taking the sidestep. It's kind of like watching a movie. You know, let's say we're watching Abram, but then it cuts to this war and we're like, wait, how did this war come out of nowhere? You know, this is in a totally different area than Abram's living right now. How is it relevant? You'll see how it's relevant. <laughs> and that's why it's important to not just read a few verses of the Bible and be like, how does this even connect? You'll see how it connects, most likely at least, if you keep on reading. And sometimes it won't make any sense and you just got to keep plugging along and maybe 70 years down the road you'll finally get it and maybe you won't until you die and you get to ask god some questions in his kingdom one day but with that said we can ask questions right now here on this earth and learn things and that's what we're doing our best to do and so let's go back to the Deuteronomy region where in chapter 2 verse 20 it was talking about this group you know we had it saying that this group the Zamzumites which were or almost definitely were the Zuzim group essentially it's saying that the Ammonite people called it that because that's what the nation used to be. So eventually down the line, the Zuzim get totally taken over and become the Ammonites. And the Ammonites called the Zuzim the Zamzumi. And so the interesting thing about the Zuzim or the Zamzumi is that it says that that was considered a land of the Raphaim or the Raphaites. And so that essentially tells us that Zuzim was a land in addition to the Raphaite area that we talked about earlier where they were in Ashtaroth. We also see that they were located in Ham and the group that was living in Ham was the Zuzim, but 
the group that took over the Zuzim was the Ammonites, and the Ammonites called them by these names. So hopefully you were able to follow the logic. If not, read the Genesis 14.5 verse, and then read Deuteronomy 2.20, and then hopefully if it didn't make sense before, it'll finally click. So we see as that goes on, we got this group, like we were talking about earlier, and the very next one, it leads into our following group, the Amims. And in the very next verse, it says that they were a people strong and numerous, which, like we were talking about earlier, you know, mighty people. So strong or mighty and numerous. And it says, and they were as tall as the Anakites or the Anakim. So this is where I was mentioning earlier. And it says, the Lord destroyed them from before the Ammonites who drove them out and settled in their place. So you see there, that's how the Zuzim eventually fizzled out is in Deuteronomy, the Ammonites ended up taking over. And we'll see soon who the Ammonites spring from, because the Ammonites obviously don't exist yet, because it's just the Zuzim. So whose son might the Ammonites be or come from? We'll see in a little bit. But with that said, we have more on the Amims that we were just starting to talk about, and they live in this land that's called Shiva Karyathim. And what we know about this area is that it is the land of Moab. And the interesting thing is we see that actually only 10 verses earlier in Deuteronomy 2, verse 10, if you go there, it says, The Emites used to live there, a people strong and numerous, and as tall as the Anakim. Like the Anakim, they too were considered Raphaites, but the Moabites called them Emites. So here we're spinning in a cycle in Deuteronomy we're coming back, and Deuteronomy is known essentially as a chronicle book that recovers and iterates what happened in the first four books, which is Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers. But in Deuteronomy, it's no wonder we have a deeper and going further account of what is happening here in Genesis 14, we have it explained to us that the Moabites who took over this group, the Amites, knew the people who they took over, and that was the Amites. So, an interesting thing, as you go into verse 11 of Deuteronomy 2, it says, Like the Anakim, they were too considered Rephaites, or Rephaim. And that's really interesting, because the Raphaites are obviously Raphaites, the Zuzim are Raphaites, and the Amims are also considered Raphaites. So this is a group, as I was mentioning, and maybe even more scary than that, maybe they're even a type of either people or human that's not fully normal and human, or they're just really dangerous and evil, and there's just somehow from generation to generation, this evil 
DNA and bloodline that's getting passed down. But anyways, it's clear that a lot of groups are intimidated by them. They don't want them around. And so God is using all of these groups through the future to take these groups out that still seem to have some connection to the Nephilim before the flood. Now we have the Rephim after the flood. And there, as it mentions, these strong people, these mighty people, these tall people, these giants, because the Anakim are probably, as I mentioned, the same group that Goliath from the Philistines came from because it mentions that they also came from that group as well. So, one last thing is I was thinking instead of reading verse 6 again and starting to talk about this next group, we can actually read about them straight in Deuteronomy 2, leaving off in verse 12. It says, Horites used to live in Seir, but the descendants of Esau drove them out. They destroyed the Horites from before them and settled in their place, just as Israel did in the land the Lord gave to them as their possession. So. Esau actually is, you'll find out, a future Hebrew who will live. But just as the Moabs are a future people and they don't exist yet in Genesis, in the part of the story we're reading, the Ammonites don't exist yet and they haven't taken over the Zuzim yet. And um, now the Horites basically are going to become the Esauites. Now, actually, we'll learn later that Esau has another name that he gets. And this is why I'm talking about all these names. It gets crazy and hard to keep track of sometimes. But Esau is also known by Edom. And Edom is the nation that is in Seir. And let's talk about Seir for a minute. So it says that the Horites lived in Seir in Deuteronomy, but now let's backtrack because in the current Genesis 14 days, they were the ones that lived there and there were no descendants of Esau there because they didn't exist yet. So the Horites in Seir, it says, as far as El Paran, but it also says that Seir was a hill country. And so a hill country is essentially a mountain range. And if you look at a map, you'll see how if you go just a little bit east of the Dead Sea and then you just go down the strip straight down, you'll see quite a bit of mountain ranges that you can traverse in that area. And that's the mountains of Seir. And so that's where the Horites lived, and Kodolomar and the Alliance. They're attacking these people as well. So we got four nations now. And just a little bit more about the Horites and the place of Seir. It says that it was all the way down to El Paran, and it also says that this was right next to the desert. And if you look at the map, essentially, this El Paran place, the El probably refers to a 
area where there was palm trees. And then Paran actually is the name of the desert that is in the western part to El Paran, which is known as essentially the Paran Desert or the wilderness of Paran. And so we have all of this. And if you think about it, we've actually went up from the north from the farthest parts of where the Rephaites are to the most southern parts. So, wait a second. Like I was saying earlier, if the Raphaites occupied all the way from above the Dead Sea all the way down to the Gulf, then even though it doesn't say it, is it possible that some of those other five city states that we mentioned in the alliance that we'll get back to in the Dead Sea Valley, that maybe there were some Rafim or many in Sodom. It's a cliffhanger that I'll leave for you because um, we'll see. But if I remember right, I don't think it actually does mention them. But there's a lot of things I think that scripture leaves as stuff for us to make inferences but one thing i really want to reinforce is that if there's something you're not sure in scripture don't ever teach it as fact because we don't know if there were any raphaim in sodom i'm just you know putting two and two together and yet at the same time it's not that simple um but it seems to make a lot of sense and so anytime that you're passing knowledge of scripture on to someone else you can say hey it seems like maybe the bible is suggesting this just as when i was talking about the slave servants that abram acquired in Egypt that it's going to play a part in a future story in Abram's life just as I asserted that I think that's probably something that is going to come into play it's possible that it wasn't and it's just a coincidence it's a co possibly a coincidence that there's Raphaim north and south of Sodom, but basically it's a straight line through Sodom. Sodom is in the middle of the hub world of this Dead Sea region, and it's just flooded seemingly with these Raphaim. So, wrapping up specifically this portion, we discussed how Alam and Shinar and uh, whatever these other areas, you know, Samaria, they're all shoehorning and taking uh, this northern uh, Raphaim uh, to southern Raphaim area. In one of them, they do just call them the Rephaim, but then there's the Zuzim, the Amims, the Horites, and all of them have Rephaim in them. So we're down near the bottom of the desert now, or at least near, and we're close to the coast. They've went far more south and conquered more territory than to the Dead Sea. They're already down by the Gulf now. If you were to make a straight line, that's the Gulf of Aqaba. But then it says essentially that they turn around and 
In the Net Bible, it says specifically that they go back again and that the term is used that they were already in this area and they turn or return, go back again. And it says that in the next one, they attacked and Mishpat, that is Kadesh, again, which is what we read earlier. So, what was En Mishpat? It is also known as Kadesh, which is a name that you'll see just a bunch more scattered throughout scripture. So, just log it in the back of your mind. But essentially, the location is disputed. But most people think that it's in, we would say, the southernmost desert part down either um, at the southernmost point of Israel or even just a little below kind of where the desert region into the Sinai Peninsula begins and it's sandwiched between some mountain ranges and it's a wilderness region and it follows by saying that the Eastern Alliance conquered all of the land of the Amalekites. And so it seems as if they're either completely subjugated and uh, we would say um, living under occupation or they were completely wiped out, which that doesn't really seem to be the case because we see the Amalekites even as far as the Samuel books. And so they're still around, they're still a people group, and at least from the research that I've done, they were kind of a nomadic, but yet pretty powerful group of people who lived in that southern Canaan wilderness area, which this area we also know is called the Negev. Another interesting thing, though, is it's possible that the Amalekites were not called that originally at the time because a lot of people believe that the Amalekites is the name that they get later on after again Esau one of his children ends up possibly renaming the tribe or that's how the Israelites later on know them by or as because you know possibly a son of Amalek uh, ends up assimilating as whatever the name of the group was before, or it's possible that there was a guy named Amalek and they were the Amalekites way before he happened to mix with the group or take them over, whatever the case was. We have this group that at least the Far East people know as what the later Hebrews know as the Amalekites. Because as we were reading before, they were using some of the ancient names, but it's possible they didn't know the name of this group, so the only reference they had to go off of was knowing them as the Amalekites. So, just as we don't know all the parts of ancient history and if we had to retell it we would just refer to certain groups by their current titles and what they've turned into in modern day it's possible this was the case and whatever this amalekite group was whether they were named that or something else they seem to be pretty strong or powerful because they're still around during the time 
even after it says they were completely taken over in that southern Canaan area. And it's possible they even spread a little more up into areas. But they were a force to be reckoned with, but barely for the forces of the Far East. Because it says they wiped them out. So, yeah, to reiterate, they wiped them out, but they didn't wipe everyone off the face of the earth. So we'll leave that at that and go to the last portion in verse 7, where it says, as well as them taking over the Amorites who were living in Hetzeron Tamar. So I know we already talked about the Amorites. So the Amorites were ranging all along the Dead Sea region from north to south, but also all the way swinging around Assyria down to Babylon. And it's possible that they had a little bit in the wilderness as you went a little west too. I haven't seen stuff that suggests that, but basically after the ally forces in the east had taken over all of the Canaan Valley or, you know, the Death Sea Valley from up in Jordan all the way down to the Gulf by the wilderness, Shoehorn swung around and attacked some of the places in the wilderness. They made sure to get all the Amalekites and then just whatever other Amorites it seemed. It says the specific place that they took the Amorites in was called Hezazon Tamar. And we actually learn a little bit more Again, this is the only place that it's mentioned by this name alone, because in Second Chronicles 20 we have it mentioned, but it gives an alias or another name for what it's called, and then that's the name that we see in other parts of Scripture. So when you see Hezazon Tamar, if you flip open to Second Chronicles 20, verse 2, it says, A vast army is coming against you from Edom, from the other side of the Dead Sea. It's already in Hezazon Tamar, that is, En Gedi. So En Gedi is the name of Hezazon Tamar. And so anytime we see and Getty, we can remember that it's this place, but where exactly is it? It says Hezazan Tamar or En Gedi is on the opposite side of the Horites, basically, which it says Edom, which we know Edom is short for where the Horites were. And so that would be the southern shoehorn on the western side of the Dead Sea. So it's on that southwest quadrant. And so this is where we leave off for this part. We have now the people of the Far East Alliance. They've taken everything in that Amorite region. They've taken out a lot of these Raphaites and Amorites, and they've seemingly obliterated the Amalekites, and they have done this shoehorn from the north of the Dead Sea all the way down to the Gulf, then up and around even into En Gedi. And that's what we got so far.
But we obviously aren't ending the story there because we're still in this world war. So we're about to bring the Dead Sea Alliance, that League of Five that was in the Dead Sea Valley region, because they're getting attacked everywhere at this point. So the question is, now that they're rebelling, what are they going to do next? Hey, I'm so glad you guys could join for today's podcast. I hope things clicked for you and that you're able to better understand God's word. Jesus said, whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. So keep on listening to what God has to say, and I'll see you guys next time. God bless.